So a very good morning to everyone. I, Dr. Poonam Joshi, welcome you all once again to our Actrack Hedonic uh, Saturday classes. Today's speaker is Dr. Uh, Swapnil Rani. Dr. Swapnil is a professor in Department of Pathology, uh, Tata Mills Center, Actrack, Mumbai. And he will be speaking on the role of uh, artificial intelligence in uh, hedonic cancer pathology. Uh, Dr. Swapnil has done a lot of work uh, on the artificial intelligence and he will be speaking on his experience regarding the same. I would request uh, all the attendees to please keep themselves uh, muted. So I welcome Dr. Swapnil. Uh, Dr. Swapnil, please go ahead with your presentation. Hi, uh, thank you very much uh, for uh, uh, inviting me for this particular talk. <laughs> I assume you can see my screen, right? We can see your screen. Am yeah. I audible clearly enough? Yeah, yeah you are audible. <clears throat> okay. So, uh, so this this particular talk, I have kind of uh, tried to uh, be uh, given an overview of what exactly we are doing in AI as such, as a broad entity in... Uh, pathology and uh, uh, and some work that we are doing in head neck cancer as such as I am primarily from the head neck DMG. Uh, but this is uh, more of a, uh, I will try and give an overview of what is possible and where this particular field is headed uh, and what is going to probably possibly going to happen and in the future and how AI is going to integrate into our workflows. Uh, and to begin with, I will just say that it's not going to replace anything that is currently there. It is only going to augment and uh, uh, enhance whatever we are currently doing uh, and make uh, enable us to do it in a much better way. Uh, and therefore, any fear of uh, the thought that AI will replace anybody or anybody else uh, or any particular speciality is actually uh, not very well founded in the uh, reality. It is more of a hearsay and a general talk gossip that happens. Uh, so AI is a very broad field. It 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 occurs. It is used in multiple areas. Obviously, the most common thing that we everybody know now is how we use the internet and how our mails are configured and how Gmail uh, works. How Chat GPT has kind of changed everything we are do doing. Where I mean, we we can talk very well to the computers now. Uh, and then there are areas in different aspects of uh, oncology where AI can have a role. You already have robotics in surgery. You already have a lot of automation in different aspects of laboratory science in radiology imaging. And there are AI models, some of which are now available on uh, the marketplace as uh, add-on tools, as, uh, as tests, and FDA-approved tests as well. Uh, but why they are still, we'll also talk about why they are not taking off uh, in a more widespread manner and why people are not still skeptical about a lot of these things. And uh, this is something that uh, will evolve over time. Uh, today's talk, I will limit myself to primarily pathology aspects and not the other images. So there are, whatever I speak on the pathology images is also applicable on radiology images and clinical images, uh, endoscopy images, any other thing that you can think of and including just data itself. Uh, but um, I will restrict myself to the, uh, the, the aspects that are relevant to pathology as in histopathology most certainly. So histopathology has evolved over a lot of period of time. Uh, initially, there are a lot of uh, naked eye examination or today what we call as gross examination, which also happens. Then there, we introduced microscopic examination to look at tissues in more detail. And there were a lot of classification that keep changing every two years. 
that are initially were based on microscopy examination. Then protein expression, we look at it a lot of nowadays, there's hardly any tumor where we don't do any IHC. And uh, of course, for treatment and therapeutics, as well as diagnostic purposes, we do a lot of gen genetic studies. And all of this is essentially uh, used in multiple ways. So as I said, the previous none, none of the previous methods actually disappeared. Uh, the newer methods only add uh, some value, additional value to existing methods. And uh, we are, the, the entire purpose of doing all of this is essentially to do the diagnosis, identify predictive factors and prognostic variables, uh, predict plan, predict response to therapy, which is probably the, one of the holy grails of oncology. And uh, all of this uh, is now uh, become so intensive that it takes at least around two weeks of uh, investigations to um, make for the for the patient to start uh, come start even reach a point where the treatment can be planned. Uh, many of the genetic tests also have a lot of uh, lo a large turnaround time. So any genomic testing you do has a turnaround time of uh, two weeks at least. And that itself introduces a lot of uh, delay and complexity in the uh, in the patient management. So this is primarily where AI models are going to help. But let me just uh, quickly begin as to how this is actually going to happen for pathology. So traditionally, we take the tissues, we do some uh, naked eye examination, we then do take some sections, and we do a lot of processing. And finally, convert it to some slides, which all of you must have seen us looking under the microscope. Now, uh, this is traditionally that been happening for many decades and centuries. Uh, but what has really changed is uh, the ability to uh, digitize the slides in a mass scale. So previously, we were obviously taking photographs of the slides, but they were always restricted to a small area of the slide uh, and the area of interest. But now we have the ability to uh, digitize the slides completely through and through. So this kind of makes it uh, a totally different uh, way in which we can now look at the slides. So um, if, if anybody has ever peeped, peeped under the microscope, you might have seen how we look at the microscope uh, tissues in the different uh, magnifications, how we zoom through uh, and navigate the different areas of the slide. We use the look at it at low power, then identify areas of interest and go deeper into the hyper magnification. Now, all of this is possible on the computer screen. So uh, as you can see, we can navigate the slide as if we're looking at it under a microscope. So now, uh, instead of the microscope, the only thing that was replaced is that instead of microscope, we can now look at uh, the the same slide on a computer screen. So as you can imagine, almost every step up to the glass slide still exists. Unlike digital radiology, where the when radiology went digital, the films disappeared. Uh, the the image directly started coming into the digital DICOM format. Uh, the radio the pathology slides still have to be made. So this is an additional process that adds to the workflow time and the turnaround times when we try to do a, a totally digital pathology. There are obviously a lot of advantages of uh, taking all the slides digital and it kind of introduces a lot of flexibility to work from anywhere. And more importantly, it allows a lot of research activities and education activities with a wide, uh, a wide reach. Uh, today, if we have to physically remove any slide, if a slide is more than a year old, it takes us at least one day to retrieve the slides. But with digitized process, these, this process can be reduced to less than a minute. So all of these things um, uh, do matter. And uh, second opinion references, we can take expert opinion from anywhere in the world. And all of these things matter uh, in patient care as well. Um, this obviously was most of uh, most relevant during the COVID pandemic, where people were not uh, not reaching the workplace. And then we had set up this entire digitized uh, workflow, where we had um, we did re remote reporting uh, for all the slides that were generated in the lab, where people were reporting from home. Uh, but this, uh, as the as the COVID pandemic subsided, as we returned to so-called normal. Uh, ah, I'll call. Okay. Uh,
this digitization, this digitization uh, uh, so to understand this, so what happens is that we essentially convert the glass slide into this pyramidal image format, where it is a combination of multiple images taken to get by the camera and then stitched together. Hello, Dr. Swapni, uh, you are not audible. Hello. Application actually scanned yes. for a 40x resolution. We expect uh, on, on an average around 2 GB of uh, 2 GB of uh, file size. And this is a compressed file size. The actual file size, file size if we uncompress all the images, is uh, roughly around 45 GB. So this is one slide uh, being digitized to generate 2 GB of uh, slides. And then if we look at our TMH uh, workload alone, we would need around 1.1 petabyte at least annually of, store, of, sto of digital slide storage if we ever have to go completely digital. This obviously is a is a uh, something that we are currently not ready with, and it is difficult to establish because there is we would like ideally would like to keep the data forever. So the in the summary, this is essentially the opportunities and the challenges that uh, all of these uh, technologies, especially the digital pathology technology, uh, is uh, brings to us. The main problems are still the storage transport network and the cost associated with doing all of this. Uh, but the one of the most important thing, even if the other problems are solved, is the user inertia. So it is like if I've been trained for 30 years of my life to look at the glass slide, it is very difficult for me to move on to look at the glass slide on the computer. You, no matter how, how, how similar the slide looks. So let's look at, come to the main topic of interest. Uh, the why digital pathologies is going to replace traditional pathology. Essentially the AI applications that are happening and that are being built and tested as we speak. Um, there are many things that can be done. I'm quickly going to cover these uh, six or seven aspects that currently digital pathology and AI algorithms are being, uh, are being made for. Uh, we know very well that we do a lot, you know, that we do a lot of counting tasks, like, for example, we do MIP1 index uh, for neuro, neuroendocrine tumors, and the even there are mitosis counting done for thyroid tumors for poor, as a diagnostic criteria for poorly differential thyroid carcinoma. And there are a lot of other counting tasks that we do, including counting the or measuring the size of the tumor, measuring the depth of invasion of oral squamous carcinoma. And all of these things can be done is currently being done visually in a very, uh, in a in a loose, uh, uh, semi-quantitative manner by approximation um, by just eyeballing the slide under the microscope. Uh, this computational pathology now allows us to do it in a much more accurate way. Uh, at the very basic level, we can simply mark out the cells as positive and negative manually, and then we can have a count and ratios and everything that can be done. But on a much more grander level, we can even have uh, basic algorithms will be built that can detect the tumor areas of interest and mark out the positive and negative cells based on the color differences in the images. And we can have automated uh, values uh, from the different areas of interest and different areas of the slide. Obviously, this is a much more accurate uh, method. And it has it is demonstrated very well in multiple studies. I'm showing just a snapshot in one of the studies which has shown that a pathologist who used computer-aided techniques had a much better inter-observer agreement as compared to those who did not use inter-observer, those who did not use any computer-aided techniques. So this is obvious that at the very basic level, computational pathology helps us uh, to reduce the inter-observer variability in the counting task and the measuring task. This is something that is uh, very important at the base level. Now, this is, uh, it, it doesn't really limit itself for this. It's, it's, the limitations are by our own imagination. Now, there are a lot of methods that have been developed that do an automated estimation of the image, the protein 
expression of the IHC, IHC slides. So for example, um, uh, in this particular example, there was this uh, particular contest where uh, HER2 staining that we that you must be aware that we do a 0, 1, 2, 1, 3 plus kind of scoring on the HER2 protein expression. Uh, a lot of uh, models were built with a very high accuracy of reaching up to 99% accuracy to classify the HER2 positive, the HER2 IHC slides into 0, 1 plus, 2 plus, and 3 plus. Now, this is something that changes things dramatically. It kind of allows us to in, introduce mechanization and automation into the entire uh, pathology interpretation workflow. Uh, AI models have now gone ahead. It's not just that we can detect and count IHC and uh, the positive and negative cells, but we can even predict what the expression can be on directly the h &E images. So this is some of our work that we had done with the IIT Bombay team, where uh, we were able to uh, predict HER2 expression directly on the h &E image. So we only had the h &E image and the IHC label IHC slide also, but the prediction was of on the HNE slide was compared to that of the IHC images. And the uh, uh, as you can see over here, that we were able to generate even heat maps, uh, which allow us to identify which are the three plus and the two plus areas within that particular slide. So it has it is now gone way ahead, and we can now even uh, do a heterogeneity analysis, and I'll give another example that was done after uh, by us. So this is uh, another example where not just protein expression, we are now able to predict even uh, some of the mutations in genome genetic in genes in uh, some of the cancers. So this work was done on uh, uh, thyroid cancer. We had taken some publicly available data and we had trained a model. We had uh, patient level information that this particular patient had a tumor which was BRAF mutated versus not BRAF mutated. And uh, we trained a model wherein uh, we were able to tell which patient was BRAF mutated or not in an unseen data set. So uh, as you can see the, the <clears throat> ROC curves on the lower right side, where we in a independent data set of 444 patients, we were able to uh, clearly mark out with 99%, 98% accuracy that uh, which patients had BRAF mutated tumors versus not BRAF mutated tumors. As a supplement to this, we had also done a lot of <clears throat> histological classification on this tumors where thyroid uh, papillary versus follicular versus poorly differentiated thyroid carcinoma classification was automated in this particular work. Uh, similar work is already happening. Uh, we are doing in lung cancer as well, uh, where we are trying to predict EGFR mutation in lung cancer. And uh, there was some similar work that happened in the radiology side as well. So what uh, essentially uh, we do over here is this, these methods are called uh, semi-supervised learning methods where uh, we don't really have too much detail on which cell of the tumor is positive or negative, but we have slide level or patient level information as to whether this patient has EGFR positive or EGFR negative uh, studies, uh, a tumor. Uh, as you can see in this particular, uh, the results on the right-hand side, uh, we trained a model on the TCGA data set, and then we tested it initially on a small TMC data set. So what we get is this average accuracy of 0.58 when we do this kind of cross-validation. So we trained it on TCG and uh, tested it on TMC. Now, so on compared to the above, the prior table, which shows that the uh, the when we trained it on TCG and tested it on TCG data set, uh, the accuracies were much higher. Now this is something of a problem in most AI models, and this is something that as end users, uh, as medical personnel who would use these AI models, we have to be very well aware that many of the models that are trained on uh, Western data sets or some even other data sets or other hospital data set may not work equally well on your data sets or your patients. This is, it is extremely important that we validate uh, any algorithm on our own patients, on our own data set before we actually start using them in our real life. 
this is the more recent work that we are still in the process. So this is another uh, work that we did. We took uh, the the publicly available TCGA data set and uh, there were some 438 patients for whom we had digitized slides as well as uh, RNA sequencing. And Dr. Pratik Chandani was gracious enough to give us uh, calls on the HPV positivity on those RNA sequencing data. And then we took this uh, out of roughly 438 or some 50 or 60 patients had uh, HPV positivity in those in their tumors. And what we did is we marked out the tumor roughly, as you can see in the, the most left-hand side image. And uh, we fed that image along with the information that this tumor is HPV positive or negative into a model. And uh, then we did a lot of uh, training, validation, etc. And then we tested it on our TMC data sets. And in this case, we took not just all head neck cancers, but just the orosaryngeal squamous carcinoma. And these cases were um, available from Dr. Mahimkar. And what we did was um, we uh, simply did the similar process. We marked out roughly the tumor boundaries and we tested uh, we had uh, HPV information from the work from Dr. Mahimka's lab. And uh, we then uh, assessed its accuracy on our patients. So uh, the accuracy, as you see, uh, we then compared it to the current uh, the current uh, test that we do as a surrogate for actual genomic testing, that is P16IHC. As you can see, this particular test performed extremely well on as compared to the P16 IHC. So um, uh, for, as for P16, the positive predictive value in our Indian patients is roughly 50%. Uh, this is something that you should remember while you see our P16 reports that the PPV in Indian patients is extremely low. The negative predictive value is much higher on the other end. Our DL test actually then performs much better in detecting HPV positive uh, tumors using just the HNE slides. So we are now in the process of actually taking this further and uh, doing some multi-centric uh, validation of this particular work and expanding on this work to other sites as well. And uh, we are hoping actually to actually convert this to a test uh, which we can deploy for clinical use and research use. So it is not just single proteins. Now there are methods in deep learning and AI models where we can use this pathology images to do even whole genome RNA based RNA sequencing like studies, expression studies on for every each and every protein, as long as you have enough data for each and every protein. So this is particular work, uh, a relatively recent work where uh, they have used RNA sequencing data from uh, the uh, tumor, tumor sections from the TCGA data set. And what they have done is they have actually modeled the protein expression of uh, nearly thousands of proteins from the RNA-seq data onto the, onto the glass slide. So now this has allowed, and then they compared it to some IHC slides to show that they match very well. So this is uh, the next level. We are currently not yet there at TMC and IIT Bombay where we have not yet done this kind of uh, uh, RNA-seq based, whole genome based uh, uh, mass profiling of all proteins and uh, other markers on the entire uh, on the entire tumor. What we have actually done is something uh, slight a st one step down is uh, we have been able to uh, show that uh, there is we can assess molecular heterogeneity on the HNE slide directly. So we know very well that in breast cancer we uh, have. Um, a lot of molecular uh, tumor heterogeneity. So when we say tumor is HER2 positive, uh, we are actually looking at the cutoff criteria is only 10% tumor cells showing 3 plus strong positivity. So the rest of the 90% of the tumor cells may or may not show HER2 expression. That itself is one of the uh, thing that tells you that, okay, there can be a lot of heterogeneity. And when patients start getting treated, a lot of this selection, artificial selection happens, which leads to... Uh, occur uh, the emergence of heterogeneity and longer this patient has stayed longer the tumor has stayed in the body the higher the probability that you have multiple clones of a tumor in the body and it has been clearly shown that uh, 
patients who are pure tumors actually have much better survival as compared to tumors who uh, patients who have mixed tumors or heterogeneous tumors. Now, imagine that we can do all of this on directly on the HNE slide. So this is some work uh, that was publicly uh, that was on a publicly available data set where they have predicted molecular mutations for around 15 uh, genes on the breast cancer patients. And uh, they have uh, done this using nothing but uh, the high level label that this patient has this particular mutation or no, and the digitized slide. And they could then do a lot of this uh, spatial transcriptomics. So wherein we can even study heterogeneity of the on the on the molecular level on the glass slide directly. Uh, compared to that, these classification tasks seem very trivial, uh, but uh, but uh, take it from me that they are not so trivial, uh, and they are also sometimes quite complicated, especially when there is a lot of heterogeneity and there are some tumors which are very different. Now, most of the publicly available work or currently available work is or is done in breast cancer or or in prostate cancer, largely because the funding from the western side is of the world is largely in those cancers. And uh, they have shown a lot of uh, uh, very high concordances of almost 99% to identify uh, tumors which are benign versus malignant. But when you start doing this for head neck cancers and squamous carcinomas, it becomes much more complicated because uh, the unlike uh, the uh, glandular tumors, squamous carcinomas have multiple cell types within itself. So you have the basal cells, the intermediate, the spinous cells, the superficial cells and the keratinized cells. There's a lot of variation in the cell morphology as they go and the, the criteria is much more complex as compared to the glandular tumors. Similar work has also been done on uh, colonic cancer and this is one of the most popular works that has been done where you can directly, even on the biopsies, identify which part of the biopsy is actually a tumor, which part is not. And as you can see, these ROC curves show that the accuracy approach is almost 100%. And uh, when we overlay on the this on the accuracy of uh, pathologists and the medical students, you can see that the models actually perform better or equal to those of expert pathologists. When you come to head and neck cancer, there is not much work done in the diagnosis of head and neck cancer, and there is and for a number of reasons, including the availability of funding, but also for the complexity of head and neck cancer, the cell types are too many in head neck cancer and we are still in its early stages and we want to do some diagnostic work on using AI models on head neck cancer. Now this is uh, an example in the upper part of the right hand side image where uh, narrow band imaging was used uh, on laryngeal cancer and uh, during endoscopy and the images were then labeled as uh, positive or negative for tumor based on the histology uh, diagnosis. And then they did a lot of training, testing, validation, and then on. But as you can see on the independent data set, the accuracy falls significantly. So from 96% on the testing data set on an independent data, the accuracy falls to almost 87%. So this fall in accuracy is something that uh, one has to be very much aware of and be mindful about and before we use any AI model. Okay, in addition to classifying, this is some work that we are currently uh, doing along with the Anant Madhavushi's group from US. This is um, uh, uh, some work in advanced head neck cancers, ad advanced head neck squamous cell carcinoma. Now we know that patients will either get RT or CTRT depending upon a number of prognostic variables. Uh, but within the uh, groups of intermediate and high risk tumors, uh, the uh, many patients who receive CTRT don't benefit from it and uh, and there are a lot of toxicity associated with it. There is a desire to actually identify uh, within the high-risk group or within the intermediate category group patients who are best suited to receive uh, uh, treatment intensification versus treatment de-intensification. Now, for in this particular work, what uh, Anand Madhavushi and his team has done is that they have taken... Uh, squamous cell carcinoma tissues, and they have identified and segmented tumor nuclei, and then studied a lot of geometrical variables of the tumor cell nuclei, including size, shape, the relationship with each other, and then uh, trained it through a model 
which has then classified the tumor into low risk and high risk for progression. So uh, it was actually shown that this particular model performs much better than the current TNM uh, classification as well as the current risk stratification that we use for uh, planning uh, CTRT versus RT for this particular patient. We are in the process of actually doing this work with that team, with Anand Madhavushi's team on our uh, patients on the OCAT, can, OCAT trial cases. Another work that uh, Anand Madhavushi and his team has done is where they are, within the oro, P16 positive oropharyngeal carcinoma cases, they were able to identify prognostic markers like multinucleation index, the number of cells which are multinucleated as a predictor of outcome. So the proportion of cells uh, which are multinucleated, they came up with an index for uh, to classify it as low risk and high risk using computational means. And uh, they showed that this actually performs much better than the current TNM classification. Now, uh, one thing that I would like to point out that all of these methods depend on a lot of other factors. For example, as I said previously, P16, uh, the positive predictive value of P16 in uh, our cases as a predictor of HPV positivity is almost 50%. That is primarily because the incidence of uh, P16 positivity is much lower in our population as compared to the Western world. In the UK and in the US, the HPV positivity rate in oropharyngeal carcinoma is in the range of 50%, while uh, in our cases, it is roughly around 10%. So there's a lot of differences that we happen, and we have we rarely ever see such multinucleation in yes. our patients currently. Yes. Hello? Uh, I would request all the attendees to please uh, keep themselves muted, please. Hello. I think Dr. Swapnil is muted. Please unmute him. Rukal. Dr. Swapnil. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You are. yeah so when, when when was I muted? Which part? Just now. Just now. Just now. Okay. Right. So this is just the multivariate cost proportion has a model for that. And I would like you to focus just on the last row. And we show that the for Mooney low versus high, the hazard ratio was much higher than any of the other currently available uh, clinical pathological variables that, uh, that predict outcomes and predict response to therapy. So another thing that we often do as pathologists is uh, we look at lymph nodes to detect cancer uh, metastasis, and then we quantify them, number of nodes, size of the mets, external extension, quantify the ENE, etc. Now, in the last decade, uh, uh, lymph node detection of mets on breast cancer was done uh, as a, and it is perhaps a solved model when you look at the accuracy, solved problem. Uh, the accuracies are approaching very high to detect micrometastasis as well. And then we uh, try and we have obviously done this for breast cancer as well, but we wanted to take this on further and do a multi-cancer uh, lymph node screening uh, algorithm. And then we are, uh, uh, this is the head neck part of it, which I'm showing to you. Uh, and then we have tried and built a model where we have taken 198 host head images of 48 patient oropharyngeal carcinoma. And uh, we looked at the lymph nodes, and then we have this uh, uh, very significantly high performance where our AUC curve, area under the curve was almost 0.95. And then we have to decide on a lot of other values where uh, uh, we decide on a threshold for a probability as to when to call the node as positive in an automated way. And when we did that, we found that uh, when we use the threshold of probability of 0.22, the true positive and the false positive rates for detection of lymph node metastasis of squamous cell carcinoma was almost nine, greater than 90% and uh, less than 10% uh, respectively. This is obviously a lot of preliminary results. We are still working on it to make it a much better way and we are hopeful that we will also deploy this for our own usage in our day-to-day -day life for our own patients. Uh, coming to the next, the immunotherapy part, uh, there are a lot of... Uh, quantification of immune cells that is required and uh, uh, even specific uh, immune cell types that we quantify, like the PDL one positive cells or just the amount of tumor, tumor infiltrating lymphocytes, et cetera. Now, all of these things become a cakewalk when you use computational methods. 
and you get much more significant accuracy for doing all of this. Now, in this particular work, this is a group from UK, uh, the Warwick group, wherein led by Nasir Rajput. But what they have done is they have uh, uh, built digital scores of uh, stromal tumor infiltrating lymphocytes and tumor associated stroma. And they have done this, uh, however, on colon cancer patients and uh, breast cancer patients. So what they have done is they have shown that this uh, uh, TIL scores have uh, uh, the, the clinically performed TIL scoring versus the digital TIL scoring. They have compared that as well as they have uh, showed that the digital uh, TIL scoring and the stromal scoring or actually have a very high uh, discriminating value in identifying patients who will have progression versus not progression. Similar work, but one more thing that I would like to highlight is that patients, the same thing, do not work uh, very well in every population. So in general, what happens is that this particular work was shown that this is, uh, in prostatectomy, this particular work uh, uh, showed very high predictive value for the African-American patients, but not for other patients. So this is something that you need to remember that uh, AI models are, uh, are, there can be a lot of biases depending on the data that was used for training. So for example, if the training data set has uh, a representation from a particular ethnic group more than it is, it might perform well on those patients while the uh, other ethnic groups may not have much uh, better a similar a similar performance of the AI model. So, so a lot of this assessment needs to be done when we assess AI models. This is also some of our work with the UK team uh, from King's College London. Um, and what we have done is that uh, in this particular thing, you have taken the predictive model to the next level in terms of that we are now looking at only uninvolved nodes. So we have taken only patients who had uh, negative lymph nodes and, and separated this from the positive patients. And uh, what we have seen that in this triple negative breast cancer cohort, we were able to segment out the individual components of the lymph node and measure them uh, computationally as well as manually. And um, what we showed that these measurements of the different components, the sinuses, the germinal centers, the interfollicular area, etc., actually predict outcomes even in the triple in the lymph node uh, negative uh, population. So sometimes you might be wondering that there are these uh, lymph nodes that you take out during surgery, which are very large, but they turn out to be negative. And what we show in this particular work is that these negative nodes also have some predictive values which are currently not yet used by us in in predicting outcomes. So this is some work that we have done in breast cancer using public data as well as some data from uh, the UK. And we are in the process of actually uh, translating this for our head neck cancer patient that we are working on. So uh, a lot of this molecular work today in almost every cancer, a lot of uh, molecular data and almost every cancer type is classified based on molecular information. But um, with the advent of AI tools, we are now uh, possibly uh, coming to a point where all of this can actually be done using just the HNE slide using deep learning methods. So let me quickly um, tell you what exactly is how we do all of this. So AI is is a very old term. It is a very is, it was first coined in the nineteenth in the twentieth early twentieth century, the middle of twentieth century, and at that time, obviously, the computation technology was not very advanced. Uh, and the current uh, uh, the current hype, the current uh, interest in uh, AI is essentially driven by something called deep learning based and the neural network based uh, models that have come to fore. And this is driven primarily by the advances in the GPU technology and the uh, computational technology, along with obviously the reducing cost of all the um, all the techniques. Uh, at the base level, the uh, the neural networks or the deep learning based networks or the CNN or from all of the different words point to different aspects of neural networks are essentially modeled on the human brain. So somebody was smart enough to uh, model uh, a unit called the uh, the uh, artificial neuron artificial neuron on the similar lines as the uh, the natural 
brain neural and it has it it is very similar in terms of that it takes inputs sums in the inputs and then uh, fires an output if it re reaches a particular threshold so this is the basic unit of a neural network and the <clears throat> the simplest neural networks are actually available in most of our softwares so for example if you have been using spss uh, uh, there is a, a simple neural network within spss as mm -hmm. well which you can use for um, your uh, statistical analysis and modeling your data. So if you're not aware of this, you should explore this. There are neural networks within SPSS as well, as well as the Excel that you use. So in general, there are at the basic level, a neural network consists of three layers. There is an input layer which takes the data and there is a middle layer which is hidden and not obvious and it does some a lot of processing. And then the output layer is, is fired to give out at the very basic level binary outputs of yes or no, or positive for tumor or negative for tumor, that kind of a thing. We can now build this up to increasing complexities, have more hidden layers, different types of connections between the layers. And then uh, depending on the initial first round of training, uh, the difference from it, the, of the prediction from the actual output is fed back into the uh, network. And this is how we train a model. So essentially, this is like training a child. Uh, you show the child a set of images and say, okay, this is a dog, this is a cat, this is a dog, this is a cat. And initially, the, the child makes some mistakes. And uh, you keep repeating this using different images of dogs and cats. And eventually, the uh, child will be able to learn that uh, what is a dog and what is a cat. So this is entirely how uh, deep learning training happens. Uh, where you tell it what you want from you and want, want from it. And then uh, finally, uh, eventually, we hope that after multiple rounds of training, uh, the model will perform a, a significant to a up to a level that uh, it's that we need. There are obviously a lot of variations in all of this and a lot of complexity in this that has come up in the field and of deep neural networks. I'm not going to go into details of it, um, but at the very base level, this is what how it works. So our eyes detect uh, the signal and the, uh, the eyes transmit the signal to the uh, V1 cortex. Uh, and then there are uh, V2 areas, V3 areas, V4 areas, and then there are association areas where the data flows from V1 to those areas. And then we make sense of what we are seeing. The V1 areas are the very basic uh, image detection, the boundary detection, etc. happens, and the pixel detection happens. While in the association areas is where the final decision as to what this particular uh, cancer, or what this particular image is showing is, is being made. So this is something similar to how the neural networks work. There are many uh, layers of multiple neurons, and each layer does a particular task. Uh, many a time, this particular what exactly does not very clear, and that's why it is called a black box, where you don't know exactly what is happening within the black box. But now there are methods to overcome all of these problems. So there's one thing that I would like to show where uh, uh, the AI models have been now. Uh, I mean, no matter how much you uh, complex the AI model becomes, there are some tasks which are very difficult. Now, this is where uh, people have used evolutionary algorithms or evolutionary tasks. What they have done is they have started with a, a set of, let's say, 100 different solutions to just make this model work. And uh, uh, each of the model actually performs very badly, as you can see on the left-hand side of the image. Uh, and uh, you select still the best models out of those and then you cross them and you breed them together and then you have different solutions that come up and then as you as the uh, breeding process progresses evolution occurs and the model starts evolu evolving on its own without human intervention so this, is, this is something this is essentially what happens in today's cgi and uh, computational works in the uh, the uh, in the the animation that happens in the movies where you essentially cannot differentiate much between what was animated and what is the real image. So this is how this particular thing works. We use evolutionary algorithms. So coming to the uh, AI as in terms of what it means, 
what it would take to take AI models to clinical development. We essentially start with, uh, it's like any other uh, research uh, question. We start with the problem statement and economic needs, identify a data set, we prepare your data set, weed out all the all the uh, noise in it, and you have a lot of annotations and labels that come, and then you do a lot of training and internal validation. Once And then once you're happy with that, you do an external data set validation. And then you start packaging it for actual clinical testing and clinical deployment. And uh, then we need to put in place a lot of monitoring tools so that we can check that the model is performing as it's supposed to do, supposed to. So um, just like we put in a lot of internal controls uh, when we run uh, multiple tests on a different machines. So to do all of this, you need large volumes of data. So uh, on, a, on a base level, if we want to achieve, it has been shown that there's a geometric progression about how much data is required to reach very high accuracies. In general, when you look at patients, we need at least around 700 patient data for a binary task to uh, when if you want a model which we can train with very high accuracy. There are uh, other gimmicks and engineering methods that can uh, do the same similar things on smaller amount of data, but then the generalizability of that model always is in question. It also needs to see a lot of variation. Uh, so, it, so whatever uh, data that whatever task we want it to perform, we have to make sure that the model has seen the variation in those in, in the variables. So for example, if uh, in during training or detection of cancer, I have used only uh, ductal carcinoma and not lobular carcinoma, then uh, the model is unlikely to predict a lobular carcinoma as cancer. Uh, and it will perform much more poorly on those on those images. Okay, so a uh, lot of the uh, other things that whether it whether the data is meaningful, whether it is accurate or not, is somewhere where the pathologists and clinicians come into play and in deciding what data is fed, fed into the AI model. AI model is also affected by a lot of uh, the artifacts that are there in histology images, the variation in color, the lab to lab processing, inter laboratory variations. Uh, color differences across different scanner types and uh, the tissue types, fixation, and a lot of these pre-analytical variables that arise from our current uh, pathology processing and fixation processes and staining processes affect the outcome of uh, the AI models. All right, so this is our flagship project that is being uh, led at our TMC, uh, wherein um, we are building our own uh, image image repository of um, radiology and pathology images, and it focuses on uh, the these areas of the AI life cycle. And uh, we have data, not just for our patient data, but also uh, the data coming in from uh, AIMS, New Delhi, Rajiv Gandhi Cancer Center, and PGI Chandigarh. We essentially are uh, putting in longitudinal data of at least a thousand patients for each cancer type for each uh, clinical pathway. So for uh, um, chemo naive there are patients who undergo surgery followed by RT chemo, or post NCT patients followed by uh, surgery and RT, etc. So this is one clinic, each clinical pathway we are putting in at least a thousand patient data into the image bank used for radiology and pathology up to the first progression at the bare minimum. And we are also using that data uh, setting up pipelines to do the annotation labels and building our own algorithms for this project. So this is one of the algorithms that is built under that uh, head uh, under that uh, heading uh, with IIT Bombay as our uh, core uh, partner, where a lot of quality control algorithms are being built to identify images which are uh, poor and should not and have poor in quality either in terms of artifacts in terms of processing in terms of uh, uh, um, the staining issues or scanning issues, focus issues and other things. And, but also to identify uh, the different tissue types. So for example, in this particular image, uh, we can see that the uh, this is a breast cancer image. We are able to actually identify the fat, the epithelial cells, the stroma, and uh, the other, aspect, other areas of the cells, in addition to identifying the uh, artifacts. So, um, what it essentially allows us to do is that uh, as a byproduct, we can even detect uh, tumor metastasis in lymph nodes, even small lymph node metastasis, and uh, 
uh, it improves the the lymph nodes, uh, the other algorithms by doing a lot of pre-processing and weeding out images that um, that uh, that have a lot of artifacts and cause problems in analysis. This is also something that we have developed uh, in house, and we have actually deployed it on our reporting platform. You must have heard of us in optic reporting that we do. And what it essentially does is. Uh, when a pathologist tries to log in, it replaces the Google recapture with an I am a pathologist recapture, which we have designed in house. And instead of seeing uh, uh, buses and cars and uh, stairs, etc., we get pathology images with some question to be answered. And all of this uh, information annotations that are led by uh, a pathologist is actually used to build uh, the uh, annotations and labels for the AI models that we use for that are being put into the training. So how is all of this going to change treatment care? Uh, one of the things that is going to do is uh, accelerate the uh, the rate at which uh, information is going to be available. So um, currently, for example, in uh, lung cancer, we uh, we need the time to pay starting patient on EGFR therapy based on all the clinical tests, radiology, pathology, followed by genomic testing is a three to four weeks. But we can actually drop this down to less than a week or less than a few days, depending upon once these models are are available for clinical use. So the, the time to starting treatment obviously is, affects the outcomes. So this is particular uh, study that was published in JAMA Network, which showed that the time to treatment initiation uh, when uh, was affected the patient survival for stage to stage. So uh, AI is not God. There are a lot of problems. AI is as much as human intelligence. It is just a test. It's a medical device. So uh, FDA uh, actually classifies it as a software, as a medical device. And it is subject to all the other uh, problems as well as guidelines and uh, uh, the uh, the regulatory issues that any other test would have. And uh, therefore, we should take all of this. Uh, uh, we should be aware about all of this and be uh, very careful as when we adopt these models in our, uh, in our in our practice. And as a general rule, let me uh, say that Western models, models which are trained on Western data, often don't work very well on our patients. This is by experience and. Uh, we are therefore in the process, we are building all of this uh, image biobanks and repositories for doing all of this. Um, we don't see uh, AI different from human intelligence. Essentially, it is very similar, just that with the help of computational technologies, we can now do a lot of this training uh, in, in a much more faster way. It is like uh, having a good pathologist uh, and then building a tool or a, or a, a registrar for him who which can help the pathologist to do his tasks much better. In summary, uh, uh, this is there are a lot of companies that are there in the in India as well as abroad uh, outside India, where uh, a lot of work is happening. Ira Matrix is actually based in Thane, and a lot of uh, other companies that are based in Bangalore and other Pune sector who do a lot of work in pathology, radiology, and other areas. Uh, and this is just a quick uh, reminder or a time of, of the timeline and the everything. And just to say that uh, just because newer revolutions keep occurring, it does not replace the older technology. It only enhances the older technology. And um, uh, AI is essentially going to do that. It is going to enhance uh, the conventional pathology, enhance uh, genomics, and uh, other omic technologies, and in addition, introduce some methods which were previously not available to us. That's all uh, from me. There's a lot of uh, teamwork involved in all of this. And this is a small, we have, we run a small uh, uh, computational pathology lab at NACRIC. You are welcome to visit us and uh, see the best point of time. I'll be happy to take any questions if you have. Thank you, Dr. Swapnil. I think it was a entirely new topic for all of us, uh, involving including me as well. Uh, if there are any questions, please pose them. Uh, so uh, I have one question only, uh, Dr. Swapnil, if uh, our students or even if I want to incorporate it in my uh, in my day-to-day uh, -day practice or eventually in our practice, 
how to go about it i know it is evolving field but is it possible to do it in a small setup or it needs a big setup which you were showing us also so how about it or what is the future dr swapna so um if you're asking for clinical see writing a paper is a different job it can be done very easily uh, you don't need we can do with a people i mean you need a engineer who can do the uh, coding and the other parts with you and uh, you have the data as well writing a paper is not a difficult job you it can be done easily but when we want to actually take it into clinical practice a lot of support is required from a lot of different areas so uh, what happens is let's say that you have done uh, initial training on 1000 patients and another tested train tested it on another 500 or 1000 patients and you are happy with what happens what what it is doing now you need uh, it to package it into a clinically deployable solution now this is not something what the iit engineer does so now you will need a software developer uh, and uh, on the uh, who can actually package all of this but then software development is again not a single field it is like you know medicine there are so many experts and so many different aspects of software development that now you need a team for software development once that is done you now want to uh, uh, you have deployed it you need to now check keep on checking like any other test you need to have a lot of controls in place to make sure that it is doing the job that it was supposed to do because what happens is over time the patient population changes okay and uh, laboratory practices change the reagents we use change the machines we use change all of these factors affect the ai algorithm so um, a lot of checks a lot of mechanisms have to be put in place to make sure that it works in the long run uh, depending on certain things some tasks can obviously be done at an individual level but uh, if we really want to do it at uh, institutional level a lot of support is required for an, from number of quarters including the it including software development including the ai engineers uh, the lab, and the medical staff as well as technicians it is a it is a we want to do it at a at a institutional level it requires a lot of support correct so it's i think it's a quite a evolving uh, field everywhere we see in every field in one including medical field and i think uh, like you said lot of support system is needed uh, at least presently and uh, we need to you need to we gen we are going to generate lot of data i think subsequently where we'll have more answers to several questions i think not many questions are there dr swapnin there was some chat by uh, burhan, burhan that sir yeah. can, can we have so, the can you read that yeah yeah so if you actually not we are in the process actually to be frank that the, once we have the lymph node screening in place uh, we would actually link it to our reporting platform where uh, we can uh, for do a lot of these things in automated way but if you have realized our turnaround time for even our uh, our reports have changed dramatically now um, i have not shown those slides but our synoptic reporting platform that we introduced uh, in 2018 essentially what we had done was we transformed the way the how we do to uh, the data entry and report generation and uh, you might be surprised that the just the changes in the way we enter data and the enter reports and the data science uh, practices that we applied into the platform we are now uh, reduce the turnaround time of uh, our let's say the routine reports for surgical resection reports from uh, 15 days to less than 7 days so uh, most if you i i have some graphs but i don't i don't have it ready in front of me but um, this is something that uh, many times you don't need you just need to streamline some processes or the most uh, difficult aspects where initially the reports were being typed by typists and uh, there was a lot of go and fro in checking and uh, cross checking and errors so most of our reports are now error free you, you barely call us now for those kind of issues and the number of uh, incomplete reports number of uh, reports which are delayed have dropped down dramatically in the in 
in since 2018 so um, you don't need a pure AI. it has a lot of uh, data science practices behind it but it doesn't have any pure ai uh, admixed in it at, at the at the moment but once we are able to build uh, some of these diagnostic and uh, detect screening systems used for the lymph nodes and for the tumor and the measurement of DOI and other things, we might be we might integrate it into the same platform so that you know a lot of things can happen bef even before the pathologist have annotated uh, have seen the slides. But the final so responsibility still rests on the pathologist. So that is always going to be the that is always going to be the case. Right. I think another question similar, predictive modeling in uh, head neck treatment continuum, do you recommend any open source models? So there are many open source. Open source is often uh, misconstrued. Open source only means that the model is available freely. Uh, it doesn't mean that it will perform equally well. So whatever model you uh, lay your hands on, you will have to test it on your patients first. And uh, as I said, we are currently working on two areas. One is on advanced uh, head neck cancer and other, uh, other is early head neck cancer, where uh, we will try to identify patients who uh, risk stratify patients into, uh, into those who will benefit from, let's say, CTRT over RT and those who won't benefit from RT from the addition of chemotherapy to RT. That is one aspect. Similarly, uh, um, the early stage cancers is obviously still a work in progress and a lot of work is still happening. And we would like to predict which patients would, re would benefit from receiving adjuvant therapy in early stage T1, T2 tumors versus obviously there is a clinical trial which is ongoing. And then uh, uh, we can, uh, uh, we would be using a uh, lot of that data uh, as it becomes available uh, once the trial matures to build all of these models. But important thing is that let's say that we build a model that works in TMH per L and in ACTOEC. It is not necessary that it will work equally well in uh, let's say Varanasi or in Vizag because uh, some of the processes over there might be different uh, including how the slides are prepared, how the tissue is processed, how the fixation happens and all of those things. So when we translate those models to those organizations, we will have to test it again over that and we cannot simply blindly take it there. We might have to retrain again on those models. There is some transfer of uh, domain transfer. We call it domain transfer where uh, we want to uh, gain the insights that we have learned from uh, the model that working on TMH and active data to that on the YZAG or Varanasi data. So, uh, if there are no more questions, uh, we would uh, con we conclude today's uh, lecture. I thank uh, once again Dr. Swapnil Rane for such a comprehensive lecture. Actually, it is all uh, like altogether a new topic for, in fact, all of us. So, I think, and I thank you once again, Dr. Swapnil. Thank you, Dr. Punam. Thank you. Thanks a lot.